Um, my name's Lorna White. I'm the Communications and Economic Development Group Manager for Thames Coromandel. Um, I'll just be um, hosting uh, the questions and um, having the chat with Mayor Sandra Gowdy and uh, beside her is Bruce Hinson, who is our Operations Group Manager. Um, this is the first of our online forums where we're going to be discussing uh, the long-term plan consultation document um, and some of the issues that are, um, we've, we'll be uh, talking through uh, throughout the month. Um, just want to say thanks to everybody who's joined online and if you do have questions that you do want to ask, um, you can email them still through now to Dana, D-A-N-A dot little at tcdc.govt.nz. Uh, we've got about 40 minutes to an hour that we've set aside for this. Um, and again, just um, if everyone could, who's just joined online, just turn off their, um, their cameras and just mute audio. Uh, it just helps us just with the streaming um, of this. So we'll get into it now. If um, Sandra and Bruce, welcome and thank you. Um, Sandra, we'll start with just talking about generally what the long term plan is about. Um, you know, setting aside what we're doing in the next 10 years around budgets and projects and levels of service. Uh, explain to us why people should care about this and, and want to make a submission. Well, it's exactly as you said, Lorna, it's about um, what we're going to spend of your money over the next 10 years and the things that we have to do and the things that are nice to do. And so it's about we're, we're trying to get you to take an interest and participate in how we spend that money. So it's 10 years. The budgets are put out there for you to make that call about what you think should be in and should be out. Um, and that goes on for 10 years. It's all those projects that you want to see happen over the next 10 years. Really important. We really want to hear from you on, on this. And we've also signposted, haven't we, Sandra, just some of the, the challenges that you know we're facing as a district and also um, other councils around the country are facing. But in particular, can you let us know what sort of what sort of issues TCDC or and the Coromandel um, is having to uh, you know plan for? Well, absolutely increased costs. There's no doubt about that. But the changes coming from central government are coming hard and fast, and the costs associated with some of those changes are um, well, they're potentially huge and at this stage fairly unknown. And so definitely the three waters space is looking like it's going to be incredibly expensive, potentially even unaffordable for us. So there's there's just that much coming out at us at the moment. Increased costs is a big one. The effects of COVID is another. Uh, and just that challenge that we have as one of the best places to visit in the country. And that, that's one of the things, isn't it, Bruce, when we talk about, uh, from an operation side of things as well, we're dealing with over, over, you know, pretty much from October till April, more more visitors and having to manage um, those people who are coming to have a good time. Yeah, we, we, that's right, Lorna. We do have um, a lot of infrastructure that we have to provide for all our, uh, all our residents and our visitors, you know, and we love having our visitors come over that summer period. But, you know, when you look at our district, we have 11 water supplies and 11 wastewater supplies. So, so there's a lot of infrastructure around the place, um, and, and you know, and costs are increasing all the time. As people um, people will know themselves uh, that that everything's um, everything's going up. You know, uh, mm -hmm. cost of fuel, cost of bitumen. You know, we use a lot of bitumen for um, resealing roads, um, so the cost of those things are going up. You know, picking up on what uh, Mayor Sandra said, we have a lot of costs that uh, come through from central government that we have to administer. Uh, so there's costs such as. Uh, waste levies that we have to put on uh, every kilogram of waste that we dispose of to landfill. Uh, there's a cost that, that we have to take for for central government waste levy uh, money. There's uh, there's emissions trading scheme costs that go on waste. So there's lots of things that are increasing all the time, pushing up costs. And so you know we work really hard to try and minimise those increases. But but I understand you know I pay rates the same as everyone else does, and that um, you know rates are increasing all the time, which is a challenge. Because one of one just adding to that on solid waste, um, well, in spite of all the information that we know and the recycling and the efforts that we all take to reduce our solid waste, the fact of the matter is it's actually increasing instead of reducing. So that has a significant impact. It does. And, and can I just also add mm -hmm. the um, the waste minimisation costs actually went up. The yeah. the government increased that levy. So when you say, give some context about how much that's increased. 
Uh, look, I can't off the top of my head. Um, so, yeah, but it, it absolutely <laughs> did, and it does make a difference. Yeah. And, and Bruce, what about the impact of COVID? Because you do talk about, you know, the, the, the um, infrastructure costs. Has COVID had an impact on that? Yeah, it has had an impact. It's, it's definitely increased cost in some areas. The other thing that's really been a challenge with COVID, and, and people will know this themselves, uh, just from online buying from overseas, you know, we get a lot of things from overseas uh, for infrastructure, such as, you know, uh, water meters, valves, um, lots of bits and pieces like that, pumps that we have to have to source. A lot of that comes from overseas and a lot of those costs have gone up. Um, and in some ways, more importantly, um, time frames, delays. We're having huge delays on trying to get things uh, even just from Australia. And like I say, people will know that themselves from online shopping, that, that things are not coming as rapidly as they were, which then pushes projects back which then increases costs. So, so it's a real challenge that we're, you know, the teams are working really hard to try and manage that and minimise those delays and those uh, cost increases. And when COVID hit, that was one of the first things we flagged was, okay, what's the essential componentry of our, all of our infrastructure that we need to make sure we've got backup componentry for? Because if, if the delivery of product was going to be slow, we were very aware of that um, mm. at the immediate down the shutdown under COVID mm. and took steps to address it. Yeah. So I commend staff for that. So we, we have signposted, yes, we, we're having to put the rates up. We're looking um, at, you know, the, the option we're putting out is this, this no, fr no frills budget. So Sandra, step us through, what does that actually mean? Well, no, the, no frills means that we put out the must, ha must do's. So those are the things that we have to do either legislatively or that we've committed to doing. And so we must do those. And we've we've um, set those out quite clearly for submitters, for people to submit on. And then we've put out another list of the nice to haves. And um, we've set those out very, very clearly as well and per ward so that everybody can look at those nice to haves and say, well, actually, I really do want those things to happen in my community or in our area or in our district. And so I'm going to put in a submission to support that. Or there's something here that's happening that I really don't like. Um, I, I want to sell that or I want to do this or, um, yeah, because we, so for instance, when I said sell that, I was thinking of the property that we have in Whangamata. That's a district property. The district people in the district might say, we want to sell that. We want to see two or three million come back into our district as a result of selling that commercial property. But there are others in Whangamata that might say that, no, we want to keep that property. We want to keep that for community use, which will result in it only returning $320 a year under the current um, policy for um, community groups use of council land. Is that a good return on an asset? Um, that'll be up to submitters throughout the district to decide because the district, uh, the, the property itself is a district property and I, that, that needed to go out there for um, public consideration. So, so we'll, we'll touch on a few of the proposals um, in this discussion. Going back to what we're saying with the no frills budget though, we are looking, as we said, about a 7.1 average rate increase in the next 12 months. Uh, we are. Rate payer. So we, what you're saying, well, Sandra, is like if you have on the must, uh, the nice to have list, what will that mean to that rates increase? Right. So currently on the must dos, the um, that uh, that is the 7.1% rate increase. On the nice to haves, if you choose anything from the nice to haves, that will increase that rate. So you need to be very mindful of that. So there are one or two instances there where the must-haves, particularly for if you're looking at Whangamata for the swimming pool cover, that's a one-off cost of about, I think, $118 or $130, something in a ballpark around about that per ratepayer. So it's a one-off cost, but it gives you a swimming pool cover for your swimming pool there in Whangamata. So there are different things like that in each ward where they might say, we really want that, but need to be mindful that if for the nice to have, it's an added cost to the 7.1% average rate. So that's something they need to consider. And, and that's the good thing about this long-term plan. People can take their time, consider it, and think about whether they really, <clears throat> excuse me, really want those things or not. 
So Bruce, can you give us some examples of some of the, the must-dos around the wards that we've said this is, you know, what we've, we've put in our uh, preferred option of the things that we, must be done around, you know, around the district? Yeah, so um, so obviously we have a split of, um, of funding across the district, of district funding and local funding, and, <laughs> and a lot of our large infrastructure sits under the district funding. So there's a lot of, um, of must-dos in that district funding class. And those are things such as uh, a drinking water standards uh, treatment plant upgrades. So obviously we're working hard to comply with the drinking water standards, which which are, are set down by central government. But obviously to do that, you need to keep moving with technology and doing upgrades. So so upgrades to water treatment plants, we've already done a number of them. We've got a few more to do. Those are in the must do's. Uh, renewing our assets. Obviously, uh, pipes mm. and roads need to be renewed at certain intervals. So, so roads might need to be resurfaced every 20 years. Uh, water pipes might need to be renewed every 50 to, to 80 years. So it's those kind of things are the must do. We can't not do those. We need to work hard on those. Uh, and you see the impact of that around the country and around the world when councils um, and organisations don't keep up with doing those renewals of those core uh, assets. So so those are some of the things that we, um, that we would classify as must do, and you'll see those in the must do list. And what about some of the nice to haves um we do um i don't know if we can share a screen right now well the nice to have we've actually got quite a few page there was sorry i, I yeah. have you got the Maybe nice to have up some there? Of those. well for the nice to haves there's there's quite a few um and so um i've got my lists um so if i can give you some examples for each ward and so um in Thames, we've got the Harika Rail Trail extension, the Pollen Street Streetscape, the Thames Sports Precinct, the Rhodes Car Park upgrade, our Kopu Toilet and the Swimming Pool for Whangamata. We've got um, the Boardwalk extension, a Harbour Cycle Pedestrian Access, CCTV cameras, minor reserves, Island View Car Park, uh, Aiken Road Toilet, Beach Road Toilet, Footpath Street Lights, Nib Curbs, things like that. So for Coromandel Town, it's Pottery Lane Ceiling, Colville Footpath, Manaya Footpath, Streetlight, Cemeteries, Minor Works, Jacks Point Boat Ramp, Buffalo Road, Side Drain, Hurricane House Car Park, Little Bay Car Park, Minor Reserves, uh, Whangarahi Walkway, Skate Park. I'll, I'll skip through all of them because that's quite a few for Coromandel Town. So for Tyra Pawanu, we've got um, footpaths. And, and, and as we can see, just uh, what was that oh, on the project sheet on the screen? So everybody's yeah, so been able to see that. Yeah, everyone can see that. That's in the consultation document. It's also on our website. Um, so people can actually just click on and have a look at it. That Matt is just giving a, a sort of high level of some of the the, um, the projects. Um, you're seeing the two colours there, the, the, the blue-green is, is the district um, rate and the, the blue is um, the local ward rate. Um, so feel free, um, you've got some time to, you know, have a look at that. Well, what you're talking about you're... is the blue-green is actually, on our screen, is actually green and purple. Well, yes. it's a purpley colour. Yes. Yep. Yeah, purpley is yep. the local rates. That's right. So, um... So I think I think the map actually gives a very good indication of what's of what's there in the in the key highlights for the nice to haves. Yeah, going through some of the the proposals, uh, council's proposals of um, of some of the the um, the issues. Um, let's talk about some of the initiatives. You you did touch on it, Sandra, just about the land purchase um, sales uh, for Matarangi and uh, Whangamata. Um, high level, tell us a bit about the, the Matarangi proposal. Um, well, the, the, the Matarangi proposal is actually laid out um, quite clearly in the document, and I, and I think it's something that um, it's not easy to get your head around that particular one. Um, so I'm actually just flicking it through it right now. And so it's, a, it's about a particular rate, targeted rate on the community for the ownership of attractive land and a clubhouse community centre. So this is something that would increase the rate substantially as a targeted rate and be ongoing for the Matarangi community. So they need to look at that 
uh, and look at what they would potentially want to absorb um, as a community. Uh, and, I, and I would encourage them to look very closely at that and what that might mean. So... This is a community-led initiative, isn't it? A proposal by uh, certain um, groups in the community who are um, asking council to purchase uh, the land there at Matarangi. That's right. So it's a it's a group of people who have already purchased the land. Now they're asking council to purchase the land, uh, and that will mean a targeted rate for the Matarangi ratepayers. Do you want to own and have responsibility for that land going into the future as a local rate? that would be a targeted rate. You need to look at the potential costs, ongoing costs for that, and the rates impact for that. Uh, so there'd be a district-wide district rate of $2.19 for the current proposal, and $34.85 for all rating units in Masarangi, uh, and for, for um, operating costs, $119 for all rating units and mattering you only as a target of rate for operating costs. So it's it's going to be a substantial increase in costs on the mattering rate payers. They might be happy to pay that additional cost on a yearly basis to have those assets available to them as community assets. But I, yeah, so that's that's something that they'll need to make to make, have some input into, get information around and take time for that to get their heads around it because it's not simple. So, and there could be variations on a theme in terms of what people might propose as alternative options. And uh, going to sort of another land purchase, again, you touched on this one, uh, Mayor Sandra, and this is about the land in Whangamata, 101 Lindsay Road. Um, Bruce, you, you, a bit of background on that one, if you sort of can give a bit of a high level as to what that, that particular proposal is about. Yeah, so just a bit of background on that one is um, is that that used to be the old council depot site for years and years um, in Lindsay Road. So, so we in council used to do all those services themselves, you know, back in the um, 70s and 80s. That's where all the council, um, council vehicles, uh, trucks and diggers and all that kind of stuff used to sit on that bit of land. Uh, Council obviously has contracted out, like a lot of councils around the country, a lot of services over the years. And so we have contractors that work with us and often they have their own depot where they might be based. And so the need for that depot has uh, has diminished over the years. Uh, there is a bit of stuff still happening there. And I think um, Lorna's pulled up the picture on the site of, I think there was like a, uh, like a BMX pump track on that site that's been there for a little while, BMX track. Um, so yeah, so, th so it's a site that, that is previously was utilised. It's not really been utilised to a full extent uh, for a while now. And so that's one of those uh, options in the consultation document that considers, you know, what is the future for that site? Uh, what do our what do our ratepayers uh, want to do with that bit of land? So that is a question for the district-wide ratepayers to say, do we want to keep this land or do we, and, and let it be used for community purposes um, at, and have a return of $350 a year, or do they want to sell this piece of land and have a return of two to three million to be able to do other things? So this is a, that's a decision that the district-wide ratepayers need to make about what is a district property. And likewise, those people that want to use it for community purpose will need to make submissions to that effect. So this is where the long-term plan is really important for people to take to some interest in and um, make submissions about what affects them. So uh, we, you've also, Mayor Sandra, you talked about the Whangamata community pool. Um, that would be a, a, a targeted one-year rate to... That's right. It's a one-off, one year, and uh, that's a one-off rate. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, they've only got the one community pool. It's at the school. It's a Minister of Education pool, but the community... Um, use it and they have a, a very good trust managing it, some excellent people that are doing that job. And so they're lobbying to see if they can get the community to support them. Uh, and that's something that the community needs to also respond back to. And so there are things, projects like this throughout the district in every area. And so the more people that can engage and respond back on each of these items, it'd be great.
For us, how different, how different is uh, the Whangamata community pool to the proposal with the Thames pool? Yeah, so, that, so that's a good question. They're quite different. So as far as council um, owned and operated pools, we only have one in the district and that's a Thames pool. So that's a locally funded activity. The Thames ward uh, pays for that and then obviously the visitors uh, and the users of the pool, they pay a small amount as well. Um, so that's how that, that's funded. So the Thames pool is, um, is a much bigger project. It's looking at at constructing a um, a possible sub-regional pool, um, so so I'd, ideally we want to try and attract some external funding from outside the district, um, because obviously a large pool facility like that is, is very expensive. Um, we need to relocate to a different site. Uh, we've got a site in mind, so we've done quite a lot of work on that, and so it's really around looking to the future. It's a few years out before we'd be doing that, but doing all that work and planning and and looking at and what we want that pool to be like for uh, for the Thames community and the wider wider area, because we do have a lot of visitors use that pool from outside the Thames area. Um, so yeah, so that's the big focus for us is is trying to track down some external funding while carrying on with the uh, the more detailed plans moving forwards with that pool. So is that pool that is that on the the must do or is that the nice to have? So there's a bit of a split with that one for the Thames oh. pool. So what we've done with that is we've got in the in the must dos we've got. Uh, basically uh, a like-for-like -like replacement, but obviously updated for new modern standards. Um, so that's in the must-dos. And then we've also got an amount in the nice-to-haves, which would take it to the next level, which you might end up with uh, with several pools. You might end up with uh, like an aqua therapy pool uh, and, and really kind of take it to the next level, which would be fantastic, but obviously it's a lot more money. Uh, and the, and there's really it's really no way that the, uh, the Thames Ward ratepayers can fund that themselves. So that's where the sub-regional funding comes in where we might look further out into the Waikato to try and fund uh, some additional additional improvements to really kind of step that up to the next level. So, and we, like I say, we've got a few years while we're working on that to kind of go through that process. Uh, but yeah, always interested to hear what the community is, um, is keen for in that area. Um, so yeah. Some of the questions that we're fielding at the moment, um, just turning to a different issue is as our, um, our solid waste activity and our rubbish and recycling. And we've got quite a few um, initiatives that we're proposing, haven't we, in, in our consultation document around um, our services there. So um, do you both just want to let uh, sort of share what, what those initiatives are? Yeah, I can talk about that. So we've, we've got a few options in there and um, and councils landed in a different different places on those options in, in the draft, the consultation document, uh, which, which um, the public can see. And, and, you know, give us their feedback on before we go through the hearings and the deliberations. But one of them, uh, just, you know, off the top of my head is that on the eastern seaboard, we have a lot of visitors, as we've talked about, over the summer period. And so we step up our collections on a lot of our uh, eastern seaboard communities from, from once a week to two to three times a week. So a lot of those communities have three collections a week. Uh, and we have a lot of people around, so there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of rubbish and a lot of recycling to be collected. So we, one of the proposals is looking at scaling that back from, say, three collections to two collections. Now, what that does is that that reduces costs um, for council and, and turn the ratepayers, and it puts a little bit more responsibility and pressure back on individuals. So, so what it means is if you've got a lot of people staying at your batch uh, and, you, and you can't kind of hold over your refuse and your recycling for the next collection, you might need to go to the transfer station and drop off, you know, if you've got a whole load of glass from bottles or additional waste. You know, it's a, it's about people then taking a little bit more responsibility rather than being able to leave it all at the end of their driveway. So so we're not saying we'd turn that collection off altogether. We're just saying rather than jumping it up to three times a week, we might jump it up to two times a week. And some properties will need to look after themselves a little bit more and get to the transfer station. So that's one example of where we've looked at, at revising the service. I can, I can give another example, but largely it's around people need to start taking a bit more responsibility about their solid waste because that's what's causing us uh, a lot of increased cost. So if, if they're, you know, they need to be a bit more conscious about trying to keep, to reduce it if they can, that would be great. Um, one of the other cost savings, which is quite substantial and which also has a significant um, aesthetic positive impact is the removal of the monarchs potentially at Whangapaua and Apito Bay. So that's up for submission and as a proposal and that's that's a substantial saving, 1.27 I think for um, the monarchs and people need to make submissions on those. Um, another one is just streamlining the trans couple of transfer stations, streamline the service at those 
uh, and that helps to reduce the cost there as well. And, and that's a good saving. One of them is Pawanui and Matarangi. Yeah. So Matarangi and Pawanui. As a council as well, Mayor Sandra, this is something that your, your councillors and yourself have discussed. Uh, we're just um, referencing here, just on there is that's actually what a mollock looks like. Uh, Bruce, do you want to just sort of give an, a, an overview as to why those mollocks are there and what their purpose was? Yeah, so um, they were put in a few years ago, uh, particularly the um, Whangapoa one, which are the photos that are on screen at the moment. Um, and it was to meet a need for that high demand during the summer period when, when everyone goes to their batches. They have a lot of uh, family and friends staying over and a lot of refuse. So, so they were installed as a bit, of a, a bit of a trial and they've just kind of stayed there. So, so the real challenge for us, and this is where we want to hear, hear from people, is, um, is around, understandably, they're very convenient. You know, they're sitting there, you can drop off bags, uh, and recycling boxes and plastic at any time. So if you go down to the shop, you can take your rubbish and your recycling with you and drop it off rather than hanging on to it at home. But the challenge for us is that we're also doing doing um, collections every week in that community. So um, in the community of Whangapoa, they're getting, they're getting two services. They're getting the collections that we do everywhere, and then they've also got this facility there, um, you know, sitting down in the middle of town. So, so that's really you know, why that's there and, and why we're looking at whether an option is to actually remove those mollocks and return it back to, to a reserve and not have those mollocks sitting in town. Um, you can see on that picture of 2011, we work, in a, we work really hard with our contractors to avoid that situation, but sometimes we do get, you know, an overloading where we just have uh, a lot, a lot of customers uh, dropping off bags and recycling and you end up with with uh, big piles like that, which is not the most attractive thing to have in the centre of well, your actually, town. I'll just butt in it there on you, Bruce, because... It actually is worse than that. We've been seeing other photographs um, where you've got um, organic waste. Is it organic? Where you put furniture, no, people are putting mm. inorganic, inorganic, sorry, where the people, got the wrong word, people are putting um, furniture and TVs and all sorts of extra rubbish outside um, besides those mollocks. And so you're getting a much worse situation. And you're right there at a most beautiful beach Whangapā, fabulous beach. Um, it is right behind where those mollocks sit. I mean, the public toilet and the, the beach reserve, that's where it all is. That's that's what that place is. That's the go-to place for visitors. Now, when you look at those photos, I mean, what is, what's the story that it's telling you? I can't believe that that's the entrance to a magnificent beach, and that's what we think is acceptable at the entrance. Um, as Bruce said, they do get collections already. So I think um, I think there's there's um, some definite argument there. So and that's in, in our council again, our consultation document that the preferred options uh, for council is to remove those mollocks. But again, we, we're wanting to get feedback from the communities as to you know whether they agree or disagree or have other ideas. Well, and and I, just on solid waste, um, just as an aside, I googled the article about um, a New Zealand company, I think it was in New Plymouth, using crushed plastic bottles and the like for roading. Um, it may have a tendency to break down after 10 years, so they're still exploring that um, proposal or idea. But, you know, the great thing is that we are, look, we're still engaging in innovation around how we can do things better. And honestly, if we can do road pavement better, I'm all for it because um, the integrity of a sealed surface, if we can keep that lasting longer, well, it's, that's a big saving to us. We've just talked again, so yes, um, increasing um, rubbish uh, recycling because again, yeah, peak population, um, we've got oh. to look at ways of minimising waste. But there's also, I mean, we talk about, yes, we have to keep putting up the rates, but we're also investigating other ways we can try and generate revenue. Um, one of the things that we have been signposting in this consultation is around um, looking about ways we can um, get more money out of user pays or, or you know, or visitor charges. So um, can you both sort of discuss a little bit about what, what we, we're discussing there, what we're looking at there? Well, fees and charges, we, we are putting them... We are putting a number of our fees and charges up across the board, and um, you know this is this is just so that users of services can be paying more for the use of that service. Because, uh, for instance, uh, we're not we're not necessarily doing it on boat ramps, but um, but wharfing wharfage access and boat ramp access, there are fees and charges in place, and 
Um, not everybody wants to use a boat ramp. So if we can charge boat ramp users, then that's uh, less of a cost on the ratepayers for providing that service than, um, than might otherwise be the case. But it's not always easy to apply fees and charges because if you take, for example, car parking, which has been the, the biggie, which was so contentious in Whangamata, and, um, and, and that was good. But the fact of the matter is you can't tell who's a visitor and who's not. So if you apply a car park charge, it's, it's pretty much everybody pays or nobody pays. So that's an ongoing discussion that we'll keep having. But in, in the interim, we, we're increasing some of our fees and charges in different areas, and they're all in the long-term plan document. And there are, there are some fees and charges that are decreasing as well, though, isn't that right, Bruce, in the, in the, particularly in some of the building activity? Yeah, so a lot of those, um, so a lot of those fees, we're not looking at doing an increase. Um, we did some um, some reasonable increases in the solid waste activity because of the increasing costs uh, last annual plan, and then also, like you say, Lorna, in the um, the building consents and inspections, we're not looking at making a change on those. We're managing to hold on to those. So, so again, we're very focused on if we can hold the costs where they are, then that's great. If costs are going up, well, you know, we do need to pass those costs on, but but they have to be valid. So we don't take these things lightly. We really take a serious, hard look at this and we you know, we really challenge the teams to make sure we're doing everything as efficiently as we can. And again, what you're seeing on the on the, um, uh, on the the uh, screen there is, is just about the fees and charges. Um, again, you can go to our website and click on the fees and charges link and it gives you the whole list of um, what the current fees and charges are and what's being proposed um, to change. Uh, some of them we have, um, may sort of uh, signal is around um, cemeteries and airfields. There is going to be a change to the, uh, in particular with airfields, the annual and daily um, charge and cemeteries, a slight increase in, um, in some of the, uh, the cemetery charges there. Uh, Bruce, also I know that we've been discussing about reviewing reserve concessions and war concessions. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we have concessions, which is basically like a licence for people to utilise land uh, that's on council reserve land or on council facilities such as wharves. Uh, and so different groups will um, or access those, those pieces of land through the year. And so a good example of that might be like a coffee cart that sells coffee. Uh, they might have a little, uh, a little caravan, a little trailer that they set up on a bit of reserve land and sell, sell to the public. So the way that works at the moment is they, they pay a concession. And I think off the top of my head, it's about 550 a year for a commercial concession. Uh, if you're a community group using it, I think it's 350 a year. Right. So, so it's fairly low cost, um, especially if you're operating a business. So what we're looking at doing is um, we're looking at doing more work and working on this over the next 12 months. So it's not something that would come in straight away, but we're going to keep working at looking at how we can um, how we can fairly fairly charge people for using uh, those services. So that again, going back to Mayor Sandra's point, we're not just loading more costs onto the ratepayers, you know, uh, because obviously. If you don't go down and buy a coffee every day from that coffee cart, but you're having to help pay for that reserve that the coffee cart's using, you know, that's potentially not the best way of doing things. We need to try and balance the costs out and try and spread that um, the cost to the to the users mostly, um, while understanding we do need to have some uh, some costs on the rates, you know, because we want this to be a great place to live. We want services uh, and all those kind of things. So we need to do a bit more work on that and make sure that we're um, we're charging fairly uh, across our assets and across our reserves. That's right, and can I just add to that that for some concessions there needs to be a greater cost because of the their more or less monopoly on using a particular site and getting they're getting a very good return on their investment to be on that site, um, and so there's no reason why they shouldn't get paid uh, charged uh, a more fair and equitable um, charge to back to the ratepayers payers for that privilege. But it, and but at the same time in doing that you have to extend the concession period for a number of years mm. to make sure that that's incentivised. So there's all of those things you have to weigh out and balance. Yeah. yeah. Just a, a question I'm getting is just um, around sort of, uh, I guess, costs. And um, there has been a bit of questions about tsunami sirens and, um, you know, the cost of them and, and is that factored into our budget? No. Um, so the sirens aren't included in our, in our long-term plan. And um, so they'll come, they come under civil defence. Civil defence budgets are within the long-term plan. So if people want to make submissions around that, they certainly can. Uh, and they'll find that around the civil defence 
elements within the long-term plan uh, document. So uh, not in the, the small summary document, but certainly in the more stand, substantive one. Also, there, there is a, a lot of other things that people can um, have their say on around the, the long-term plan. There is a lot of documents, isn't there, Bruce, um, that there is a, a supplementary just to the consultation document. What sort of yes. things are in there? Yeah, that's true. So there's other documents that, that we do use to build these up. So there's documents such as the infrastructure strategy. Um, so that's a 30-year strategy about how we're going to look after our infrastructure, what we're planning for, because obviously when we're putting pipes in the ground and building treatment plants and roads, those things can last a lot longer than the 10 years that the long-term plan focuses on. So, so it's a requirement that we have from central government that we do an infrastructure strategy at the same time as we do a long-term plan. So that's a, that's a big document, has a lot of um, costs in there, a lot of big numbers going out over 30 years. Uh, we have financial strategy, how are we going to manage our finances? That's another document that we have. We have development contributions policies. Uh, so there, there's lots of different documents. Uh, revenue and, some and of them, finance. Yeah, revenue and finance. Some of them are, are pretty meaty, you know, and they, you kind of got to wade your way through them. But if you're interested in that detail, then that's all available uh, for, for anyone to look at and work through. One, one of the other things too is that in the, in the documents, we have identified a preferred option. We have to do that. That's, that's required by legislation. So we're required to do that, identify a preferred option. But any option is able to be considered. So that's where submissions are really important because we've got some fantastically knowledgeable people in our communities. And so um, they may have a better suggestion or better option for a better outcome than what we, we might have proposed. So anything goes, folks, just put in a submission. Um, if it's of an interest to you, put in a submission. That's, that's the key thing. Also, I mean, we're talking just then about strategies and um, infrastructure being a particular one because I know councils all around the country are struggling with, um, you know, having the infrastructure for um, services. There are some meaty bits of work that are coming out of Wellington around, um, I guess, uh, you know, with the Three Waters, Mayor Sandra, and also with um, the RMA reform. So can we, you know, just sort of signpost a little bit about what, what that involves? Oh, wow. Well, Three Waters, talk about a nightmare. Can I say that uh, I just read the uh, more of the Three Waters, sorry, sorry, uh, the Water Services Bill. Now, um, we, we, the staff did an excellent submission to that uh, and last week, and so we're having a hearing at the Thames Civic Centre with the Select Committee by Zoom on the 24th, and so that's open to the public. And the costs in that, so anybody that's a water supplier has to first apply to be authorised uh, and, and go through a process to become an authorised supplier. Um, they then have to um, pay a levy, they'll be required to pay a levy, They'll be required to do a water service plan. They'll be required to do a water risk and potential risk um, plan. Uh, they'll be required to do monitoring. And in the case of local authorities enforcement, um, there's, and there's, it's, it's just a whole raft of things. And on every one, I can hear ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. So the dollars of this are going to be huge. Uh, I'm, I'm um, gobsmacked by... Um, some of the content of this water services bill, and one of them actually refers to having to do the aesthetic value, assess the aesthetic value of the water source as well. So and this is all around the three waters reform. So can I say that it's just an avalanche of change and cost could potentially um, do away with local authorities. Bruce, is there more that we actually know about what's happening with the water reform? What is it? Where are we sitting at right now with um, what we're hearing? So yeah, so so following on from what Mayor Sandra is saying, is they're taking all the leg legislation is going to be going through the house soon. So they're really kind of pushing this one ahead quite quickly. Yeah. And yeah. the indications are that they want to have um, a much smaller number of people controlling water across the country. And so what you're looking at is. Um, there's a number of entities, maybe only four or five entities across uh, New Zealand that deliver water. So at the moment you have uh, local councils deliver water, 
Uh, obviously in Auckland, you've got water care, which delivers water for all of Auckland. But they're looking at going, like I say, to four or five across the country. So it'll be much bigger regions. And we don't know the detail on that yet. They're still working through all those details. Um, Department of Internal Affairs, along with central government, uh, possibly like in our area, we could end up with a really large um, area for the uh, the entity to cover. It might be from Taranaki all the way through the Waikato, including all of the Bay of Plenty up to the Coromandel. So, so when you think about that, it's a that's a very big area um, to cover. So this is some big change, um, as Mayor Sandra said, it's significant change uh, across the country in the three water space. So all of that all of that criteria I listed. Every single one of the private water suppliers that currently exist is going to have to meet every single one of those criteria. And if, if they can't, it falls back onto us. And of course, there's a huge amount of cost in upgrading those systems to meet this, whatever standards are required. This is, this is not, if anybody thinks this is going to be a cheap and easy process, it's not. And 60% of the water supplied in our district is not supplied by us, they're all private suppliers. We only we only pr provide reticulated water to 40% of the district. So in terms of the consultation document, we've got water projects in there. People should be still making submissions on our water services because at the moment it's still business as usual, is that correct? Absolutely, it is business as usual. They, they're, they're pushing this along at the rate of knots, it's just and uh, the avalanche of change is huge. And if they thought the RMA was problematic, and that's another one that's coming down the track, it is. And of course, there's the climate change, the emissions, um, the RMA, as I've said, and then just all this three waters reform. It's just an absolute avalanche. And if they thought any of this was going to be any better than the current RMA, they're dreaming. Coming back to just uh, uh, what we're having to deal with now and just with the consultation process. So we, as you each know, this is the first of our online forums. We've got local radio and newspaper. Um, you're actually um, doing a, a visit around the district this weekend as well, aren't you, Miss Sandra? So tell us a bit about what's planned for that. Um, that's right. Well, so the idea is to have coffee mornings in, well, just drop-in centres really. Uh, so there's no coffee, but I'll be needing the coffee. Um, so it's drop-in centres at each in each of the wards, so that people have got a chance to come in any time during that that two or three hour period that I'm there, and just to chat about anything that they're interested in, or or um, scope out ideas or some of their thinking, um, and just get questions clarified. So I'm, you know, I'll be doing the best that I can, um, and. And I've dedicated myself to doing this one around the district, but I'm happy to for people to ask questions at any time. So I'm quite looking forward to it, actually. Be nice to get out there and engage with everybody. And, and Bruce and I will be there, and we will be providing tea and coffee, and we have also scraped up uh, a budget for biscuits as well. So we do um, <laughs> hope to see some people um, coming to have a chat with all of us. Um, um, they'll be all coming for the cup of tea and coffee and, and the biscuit. <laughs> Wine biscuits, I hope. <laughs> we might we might spring to chocolate, hopefully. No, no, no. <laughs> so consultation period that runs until that four pm um, of the twelfth of April, um, and there's a whole bunch of ways, isn't there, that people can can share their feedback. Um, as we've said, um, you know, you can actually uh, over the weekend make a submission while we're at, um, in your centre. Um, just up there on the screen, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can have your say. Come into our, you know, our area offices or our libraries, and you can make a submission actually on the computers there. Um, we do have hard copies of all of the admission forms if you um, want to do it that way. And again, um, digitally, there is lots of ways um, to to have your say in that respect. Uh, because I guess, Sandra, one of the things we do know is that um, our demographic there is a, a, a very diverse audience of people who like to um, get information in a lot of different ways. That's absolutely right, and and I'm a great believer in sort of having as, as many options available as possible because not everybody uses the internet, not everybody can get coverage. Um, and so, yeah, even snail mail. But I, I think um, if you've got access to someone being able to drop it into a service centre in one of the wards, that's, that's just as good too. So even a phone call, but whatever method suits you, if you can, if you've got something available to you, do by all means use it. I, you know, we really want your input on this long-term plan. It is important. 
Tell us as well, because um, there is a box to tick if you want to, to be heard at a submission, um, and you, you've been involved in this many times before. Um, what does that actually involve, and is that quite a daunting thing to do? Um, it's not actually. Uh, to actually do a submission or to go to a hearing? Which do you mean? Both. Um, well, it, no, it's actually quite a convivial social affair on occasion. Um, you know, and I, I particularly recall one of the last ones that we had in Fitianga, um at the, um, I think it was the beach motels there in the conf little conference room, which was, it was great. And, you know, everybody knew everybody else and they came along and they could hear what was being said. And, and as long as they're respectful and they respect the fact that other people are waiting to be heard. So there are time frames and they're there for a reason. So I remember, I felt sorry for one gentleman that, um, he was waiting to give his submission during his lunchtime, but there was a submitter in front of him who refused to um, give up his spot, uh, and uh, he missed out. He had to go, and I, and I thought that was actually um, a bit sad, and it was totally disrespectful of the other submitter. So it's really important that you respect other people and their their opportunity to have a say, and that's why we have time frames around that. Um, but it's very convivial uh, and it's good to see everybody there. And also uh, with the afters, uh, with the hearings as well, uh, you can, um, we are going to be uh, putting them online. Um, so we, depending on the numbers of submitters, um, we're investigating whether we can do it in different centres, depending on the number of submitters from each area um, and also doing it online. Uh, last year, Miss Sandra, we had a, a couple of hundred people, didn't we, with the annual plan, and that was a, a, an online hearing uh, due to COVID. Um, how did you find that experience? Great, actually. Um, you know, having so many submitters and doing it on Zoom, every, I, I actually felt that it was better in some ways because you had direct one-on-one, -on -one, you didn't have anything else in the room, and, and you could really focus on that submitter so I thought it was very good. You know, that was that was one of the pluses of COVID was that that new push into technology to be engaged so that we can be engaged from a distance. Uh, I thought it was excellent, actually. I, I really love the fact that people have got that opportunity. And particularly a lot of our, yeah. our ratepayers don't live in the district. They're able to, uh, you know, submit uh, or talk online from another centre around the country if necessary, which is which is great. Yeah, and so while it's a really important subject, people, and it's, it's a really important thing to do, people need to just get engaged and, and have some fun with it, though. Have some fun with it. Long-term plans being fun, Bruce, have you? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but if, you, if people think it's going to be daunting, that's what I'm saying, or just... Treat it as a whole new experience and one that you want to enjoy. Yeah. And also other councils, as we know, around the, the whole country are going through this process at the mo at the moment. Uh, Bruce, we, we also get a lot of scrutiny through Audit New Zealand as part of this process. Can you can you tell people what actually that entails and how important that is? Yeah, so that is a big job. Um, and obviously for this consultation document that's gone out and available, um, Audit New Zealand go through that with a fine-tooth comb. So they have a job, and you'll see there, their names on the document near the back. They have a job that they need to go through and check that um, everything we're saying is based on good information and good data. Uh, and uh, if we've got um, holes in our data, uh, at least we need to say that we've got holes in the data and what we're doing about fixing that. So that might be around, you know, we've got a lot of old pipes and Thames, for example. We've got a lot of information on those old pipes, but there's some pipes we don't have great information on. So, you know, we're just honest about that and say, look, we don't have good information on these pipes because they're very old. But this is our plan on how we're going to get some better information on them so that it informs our decision making in the future about what we're renewing. So Audit New Zealand go through the consultation document, they go through the asset management plans, they go through the infrastructure strategy, the financial strategy. They review everything and make sure that basically we're following really good process and that the documents we're putting out can be relied upon by our, our customers and our ratepayers when, when they're submitting and, and when we're making decisions at, at Council. Can I just put a shout out to the auditors too because um, Things changed radically for them too under COVID. And so there was a lot more pressure on them this year because of COVID. And, and you know, they've been really under the pump this, this year in particular. And um, that, that, I mean, all councils throughout the country, as you said, are going through this process. 
and it's not small by any stretch of the imagination. So a big shout out to all of our auditors who are doing such a good job. We we really do appreciate it because it, it's a, again it's an important part of the process. And and I just this is the summary document. I mean I I, I just think that, that um, this is a delightful summary document. It's one of the be better ones I've seen, uh, and I love it. I think it's laid out things really very clearly. So if people feel a little overwhelmed by the more substantive LTP document, the summary one is, is lovely to go through and just pick up on the key points. One of the ones that I just want to point out is the one on the last page about what you get for your rates. And um, so if you're looking at weekly payments, and if you do a weekly payment for your phone, you'd be paying about $31 a week maybe for electricity, maybe about $38 a week for petrol, well, about $50, $42, $50 a week. This is on average. Uh, and um, for rates, you pay on average about $42. Though I notice in here you're talking about $60 a week. $61.95. Um, but for that, for the for your phone that you pay $31 a week, it's a one-off, it's a one activity. And for electricity, it's the one activity at, at $37, $40 a week. But for rates at $60 a week, it's not one activity, it's a whole raft of activities. So it's all of those things that you can see down there, right around that circle, and down the left-hand side. There's just so much there, and roads, footpaths, wastewater, stormwater, solid waste, community spaces, planning, regulation. Well, you don't really want that so much, but you get it. <laughs> so um, it just helps to put it into context, context a little bit about how much more you get for your rates than you might for other services that you pay for. And at the back of that document as well, just the very back cover, it sort of steps through the process uh, of where, where we're going. So, you know, we know that um, our consultation is running until uh, Monday the 12th of April, and then we'll be having hearings in May. Um, and then um, Audit New Zealand gets another pass through it before it goes to council to be adopted on the 30th of June. So we've still got a bit of a way to go on that road, um, but we're, we're near, we, you know, we're making our way there. Um, just want to say thanks to everybody who um, has come online and um, the people who have sent questions in advance. Uh, we are going to be doing several more of these online forums over the month, so we have got uh, questions that we haven't been able to answer today. We will be um, using them for uh, questions in the next forum. Uh, Bruce and Sandra, any any other comments that you'd like to make? Uh, just one last one. Um, I see that it looks like a beach hop car driving into the sunset. <laughs> that, that beach hop coming up soon. Excellent. Next weekend. Next weekend. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for those that participated. It's great. Brilliant. And thank you, everyone. And uh, this recording will be loaded up online um, later this afternoon. So thank you very much for your participation. See you later. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>